preview. Well, let's go back to the scripture that I started last week, Daniel, the 10th chapter. In Daniel 10, we're going to start there at verse 10. And it says, and behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before the Lord, thy words were heard. And I am come for thy words. But the prince of the king, kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty and one days or one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Again, verse 12, from which we get our theme of this series. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for, for, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart, to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Thy words were heard, and I'm come for thy word. So we're going back into this is part two of this series that I've entitled, Your Words Are Heard. Your words are heard. Because if we're going to really be people of faith and operate in faith, we must pray in confidence. Declare in confidence, speak in confidence. When I say in confidence here, I'm not talking about secretly. In confidence, I mean with the assurance that God hears us. We, when we pray, we're not just going through some exercise in futility. When we pray, we're not just going through some type of religious ritual to gain brownie points. No, when we pray, Things move, things happen. We ought to have such assurance that when we pray, as I heard somebody say years ago, somebody came to him and said that their husband was messing with another woman and uh, he left her and she wanted him to come back and she wanted him to pray. She said, now, now, now make sure you want me to pray because as long as he'd been gone, I don't know if, if he did all that with me, I ain't sure I want him back. But if you want him back, I'll pray. He said, now just make sure you, because when I pray, he going to come back. And I don't, yeah, he may come back dressed or undressed. I don't know what he's going to look like, but when I pray, he going to come. So you need to make sure you want him back. Because when I pray, stuff going to happen. That's the kind of assurance we ought to have. That when we pray, we're going to get an answer. When we pray, we're going to have responses. When we pray, angels are going to move. When we pray, demons are going to flee. When we pray, tumors can dissolve. When we pray, there's going to be supernatural turnaround. When we pray, there's going to be breakthrough. When we pray, strongholds are going to be broken. When we pray, what's down is going to be lifted. When we pray, what's out is going to be brought in. When we pray... Something's going to happen because we believe what the word of God says, and he says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. So we need to pray with assurance that our prayers are heard. And what we see here in Daniel 10, Daniel's praying. He's believing God, and he's, he's interceding on behalf of a vision that he had seen but didn't understand. Daniel was one who had visions and dreams and got understanding of dreams and visions such that his gift brought him before great men. And that gift was, in this case, his ability to interpret dreams and understand the times and the seasons. So he comes before the king, even on prior occasions, and gives him understanding and interpretation of dreams that he had. And now this one has him befuddled. This one has him a little bit confused. This one, he don't quite, and so he simply goes to God, and, but it looks like it's taking a while for Daniel. In this case, it's taking 21 days. And when the angel shows up 
to give him understanding, the first thing he says to him, he tells him he's greatly beloved. But the emphasis of this series comes from verse 12. He said, from the first day that you turned to God, the first day you asked God, the first day you started your fast, the first day you started your consecration, and you set out to ask God for understanding and to discipline yourself for the Lord, he said, your words were heard. I, he said, I'm showing up today, but this is not the first day your words were heard. Your words were heard from day one. Somebody say from day one, from day one. You got to know when you pray from day one, something's happening. Glory to God. It may take 21 days to show up. It may take 100 days to show up. It may take 10 years to show up. It may take 30 days to show up. But from the day I pray, from day one, from minute one, your words are heard. And he says, the issue, Daniel, had nothing to do with you. There's some spiritual warfare going on. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, that's, that's a demonic territorial principality, a demonic spirit that reigns over this area, tried to keep me from getting to you. And God sent a reinforcement through the warring angel Michael and came to help me. I'll deal with that probably next week. That angel came to help me help you. God already said you, you're greatly beloved. So, so if one angel is enough, I'll send two. <laughs> if two is not enough, I'll send three. That's how much he loves us. He'll do what's necessary to help us. Glory to God, because we're his children. He said, I want you to understand. Don't ever doubt that when you pray, that when you talk to God, when you make your confessions, that your words are not heard. So just, we said last week, the first reason he said, number one, that your words are heard because you are loved. Because God loves you, you need to know that his ears are always open to you. That his ears open to you because he loves you. He, not only that, he even anticipates our needs. He, he will supply all of our need according to his riches and glory because he's already put them in the storehouse for us. He's already given everything that pertains to life and God. And when we pray, when we confess, when we declare, when we decree, now we're sitting in the order from the supply house for all that he's already set up for us. So when we pray, when we speak, when we confess, when we declare, when we decree, you're merely putting your order for what God has already anticipated that you will need. Let me move on this week and give you this second point. First, your words are heard because you're greatly beloved. Secondly, I want you to understand that there, there's warfare over your words. There's warfare over your words. Daniel prays, Daniel decrees, Daniel declares, and he said, I was on my way and a devil tried to stop me. I was on my way and a high-ranking demon of the demonic principality tried to keep me from getting to you. Sometimes you need to understand the more spiritual warfare that you have, that means you are somebody great in the kingdom of God. Come on now, you don't, you, if, you, if, 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 if somebody just got a tent, you don't need a bulldozer to knock down a tent. You can tick, kick that down with one foot. But a skyscraper, you might have to have that implode. You have to, get, you have to prepare that. You got to design that. You got to strategize how that's going to come down. Come on now. If, 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 if you're one of the people who feel right now, all hell is breaking out against you, that means you are greatly beloved. That means you are somebody in the kingdom of God and you are bigger, you are a bigger threat to the kingdom of darkness than you even realize you are. Sometimes you know you have to know how important you are in the kingdom of God based upon the opposition that you have. So he says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. He, this was a persistent devil. He didn't just give up on day one. He, he kept going for 21 days. So you need to understand that when you pray, when you confess, when you decree, when you declare, and it looks like sometimes you're not having manifestation, it's not that God doesn't love you. Love you. Get that settled. That I'm love. It's not that God is slack. P. 
Peter says, we know that God's not slack concerning his promise as men count slackness, but, he, but he's long suffering, desiring that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. God's not slack, nor is his arm too short to reach your situation, nor is it that he does not have the strength to deal with all that you're going through. Sometimes you're just going through spiritual warfare where there's, there's demonic activity going on trying to keep the angels of God from ministering to you. Sometimes there's just opposition and spiritual warfare over your words. Over your words. You know, when we was kids, we'd fight somebody, we'd, somebody say something and we would get them in a, in a, in a, in a, in a chokehold or something and say, take it back! Take it back. That's what the devil trying to do with some of y'all. He's trying to, trying to put you in a chokehold. He, 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 he's trying to strong arm you and say, take it back. Take it. No, no. You got to make it say, no, I'm not taking it back. I believe God's a healer. No, I'm not taking it back. Great shall be the peace of my children. No, I'm not taking it back. All my children going to be saved. No, I'm not taking it back. I will be out of debt. No, I'm not taking it back. I will be a millionaire. No, I'm not taking it back. I'm coming out of this. No, I'm not taking it back. I'm going to do everything God said I'm going to do. Make, tell the devil I'm not taking it back. One time the devil's trying to get you to take back your confession. Take back your prayer. Stop believing God. Give up on your words because there's spiritual warfare going over your word. Look at Luke 11. Luke 11, 53 and 54, which is why, remember I said last week that our words are heard both positive and negative. Both, both positive and negative. Luke 11, 53 and 54 says, and he said unto, as, and as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently. They tried to, tried to get Jesus off his game. They tried to aggravate him. They tried to pry him and, and poke him. To, they, they, okay, they tried to get on his last nerve. Begin to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak many things. That's why James later tells us, be slow to speak. Swift to hear, slow to speak. Tried to provoke him to speak many things. Look at this. Why were they trying to get him to say a whole lot of things? Verse 54 says, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. That's why you got to be careful of your words. Because by your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned. And sometimes you're going through situations where the devil's trying to get you to say something that he can latch on to. Because angels respond to words of faith. Demons refer, re respond to words of doubt, fear, and unbelief, and negative words. So they were laying wait for him, seeking, looking for an opportunity, trying to be opportunists to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Luke 20 and verse 20. Another scripture here, this one's from the Amplified. It says this. It says, so they watched for an opportunity to ensnare him. They watched for an opportunity to ensnare him. And sent spies, you need to catch this. Y'all don't have this scripture? Come on now. Luke 20 and 20, it put it up in whatever translation we got. Thank you. So they watched for an opportunity to ensnare him and sent spies who pretended to be upright. Who pretended to be honest and sincere. That they might lay hold of something he might say so as to turn him over to the control and authority of the governor. Are, are y'all seeing this? Sometimes the devil is being that slick to send people around you and put situations around you and there are people around you think they are friends. You think they have your best interest at heart, but they're sent by the devil, but they look just like you want them to look. Don't get me started, ladies. Don't get me started, brother. But they look just like you want them to look. 
They, they, they check off everything that you had on your superficial list. Who pretend to be upright, honest and sincere, that they might lay hold of something he might say and looking for an opportunity to turn him over to the control and authority of the governor. So Jesus was very deliberate about his words. The New Living Translation of that verse, the latter part says, they tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported to the Roman governor so he would arrest Jesus. Do you see why we got to be slow to speak? We're in spiritual warfare. Don't give the devil words to latch on to. And the other thing, the Bible also says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He tries to accuse us, trying to get us locked up, trying to get us caught up, trying to get our, cause our blessing to be hindered, trying to even make us think we no longer qualify for the blessing of God and put us in guilt and condemnation. He's the accuser of the brethren. So don't allow your mouth to cause your blessings to be hindered. Now the place, it says, neither say before an angel, don't, don't let your, your, your uh, flesh, your, your, your mouth cause your flesh to sin. And you say, oh no, my bad, it's a mistake, I didn't mean that. So there's spiritual warfare over your words. I need you to catch that. There's spiritual warfare over your words. Now, for those of us who, who have been taught and understand how faith principles work, this is not new. But we can become lax. Uh, uh, it, are we back to that again? You got to be back. Are we back to that, that again? That you got to be careful about your words? What do you mean back to that again? Why'd you stop? Maybe you would have had greater manifestation if you had kept this thing in remembrance. One of the scriptures says, I'm, I'm going to stir up your remembrance. Some of you, particularly those connected with right direction, you've heard this for years. Can I tell you, in the midst of a pandemic, all the more. This time last year, when they first talked, to, to start talking about being shut down and the economy shut down and everything shutting down. And this year, what, for four weeks? Then we're going to go to six weeks? People thought at most eight weeks. There are people... There are people who sealed their fate as soon as they heard that. They said, I guess I'll never start that business now. I guess I'll never have a house now. I guess, I'll, I, I, guess I, I, I just got that job. I guess I'm going to lose it now. They sealed their fate through the whole pandemic and thereafter because of words that they let come out of their mouth. Y'all remember the story where Jesus is, is on his way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter who's on the critical list, who they've given up on. And on his way there, this woman, Canaanite woman, a, a, a woman with the issue of blood comes. And she touches the hem of Jesus' garment, tries to steal a blessing. Don't, she don't want an autograph. She don't want an audience. And let me get some of his anointing that can bring healing to my body and go on about my business. And Jesus stops. Say, who touched me? And he's the type said, come on, Jesus, for real, for real. Who touched you? All these people, you told me who touched you. Everybody touching you. He said, no, but somebody touched me with faith. There's been a withdrawal from my spirit. She tells him what happened. She gets healed of the issue of blood. And then by that time, I don't, it's, it, it, I don't know how long it took, but it took long enough that now the girl is dead. And they said, don't even bother to trouble the master anymore. And Jesus looks at Jairus. The last words he had given to that woman was, your faith has made you whole. And he says to Jairus, he says, fear not. Keep on believing. Your daughter will be made whole just like this woman was made whole. One translation says this. He says to him, keep on believing. 
And what Jesus did before Jairus could say anything or respond to these people's negative report, Jesus arrested him and said, stand faith. I learned this principle years ago. When you get bad news, your first response to that bad news can seal the outcome. When you get bad news, you either got to respond in faith or you respond in fear. You're going you're gonna to respond based upon what God can do or you're going to respond based upon what the circumstances look like. So Jesus said, believe only. Keep on believing. Don't you let doubt come out your mouth. Don't you agree with what they just said? Your daughter going to be made whole. Glory to God. And some of you, again, as things started happening even a year ago in the midst of this pandemic, oh, I'm, I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose my house. I'm not going to have this. This isn't going to happen. That's not going to happen. Imagine if all of you have high school senior athletes who were concerned whether they're going to still get looks from, for scholarships. If you taught that, I, 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 listen, God got his hand on you. God's going to let the right person see you at the right time, whether you play or don't play. Come on now. See, do, do, do you see how it's so important the words we speak and we can help seal our kids' destiny. We can cause them to either to stay in faith or get in fear. It's spiritual warfare over your words. Hebrews 4 and 14 reminds us, it says, seeing then, Hebrews 4, 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest, the high priest is an administrative office, that is passed into heavens, who is Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Don't let go of what you believe. Don't let go of what you said. I don't care what the economy looks like. Don't let go that he's your healer, that he's your provider. Don't let go that he's the God of increase. Don't let go that the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Y'all know I quote that scripture all the time from Psalm, was from Psalm 115. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Do you know that scripture does not take a time out because the world's in recession? Do you know that word still works whether the gross domestic product is increasing or decreasing? Do you know that that word does not matter whether the country appears to be in deficit? No, it always amazes me, and this is, this is, this is, this is not a political state, this is just a fact on both sides, Republicans or Democrats. When it's something they don't, they don't want to pay for, everybody, everybody, everybody concerned about the deficit. When it's something they don't want to pay for. If something you want to pay for, you hear no, no mention of deficits. Soon as something you don't agree with, they're concerned about deficits. And then we don't have the money for this. Well, where do we get the money for that? What, and, what, you know, and thank God we're, we're, the great humanita we're the great humanitarians of the world. But it always amazes me things like, you know, we can't get the water fixed and, and get, get good water in a community called Flint, Michigan. And yet, boy, but let something happen to a country we ain't never heard of. United States is going to give them $3 billion. We, we, we got $3 billion? Where did that come from? So you you got to understand, I don't care what's going on in the economy, what's going on. God has promised he's going to supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. When you understand <laughs> that his riches and glory, you don't worry where it's coming from. You just know he got it. My... My, my grandson, he's been trying to figure out how much money I got. He says, well, Papa, just how, just how much money do you have? I said, don't worry about it. Well, what you need? I, I, no, I just want to know how much money do you, what do you have, about 100 million? I said, speak on, son. Confess it. Declare it. Now, suppose I said, 100 million, ain't no way I ever have a, the devil, he spoke it, I believe it. Come on, if it's words of faith, words that you believe, words you want to receive, say, I receive that. If it's words that you don't want to receive, you say, I don't receive that. Hold fast to the profession of our faith. Hebrews 10, 23. Let's hold fast the profession of our faith. What we said we believe. Without what? Wavering. 
James tells us about what happens when we waver. When we wave, when we waver, we're like the, the waves of the sea. And let not that man think he shall receive anything from him. He loves me. He loves me not. I'm healed. Oh, but I'm sick. Uh, 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 I'm rich. No, I'm really poor. No, come on. You got to hold on to God's word and keep saying the same thing no matter what it looks like. Raise God's word over your situation. Hold fast to the profession of your faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promise. I was talking to, to Minister Sean Bigby yesterday. We, we were talking about a situation that he had to negotiate about something. <laughs> and he said, he said, Bishop, but when, when, he said, I was just as nervous. I said, you, ne you never could tell it. Because he said what he wanted and just had it and, and stood flat footed in it and he didn't waver. Listen, when you believe God, you got to stand on it, speak it, and don't waver. Because he's faithful, that promise. It's not like he can't do it. He's faithful, that promise. Say it, declare it, speak it, and don't waver about it. Stand flat footed and say, yeah, I believe God, I'm healed. I believe God, things are getting better all the time. I believe God, I'm going to be out of debt. Yeah, I'm going to send my kids to college debt free. Well, how are you going to do that? I don't have to figure that out. That's God's problem. My responsibility is to, believe, to speak it and believe it. That's the believer's responsibility. We speak it and believe. We let God do the heavy lifting. Yeah. Hallelujah. That scripture, Hebrews 10, 23, I'm going to give you from four translations. That was a King James. Hebrews 10, 23, New Living Translation says, let's hold tightly. Hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. How do you affirm it? With your mouth. With the mouth. Confess and made unto salvation. Hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. God, I just need you to keep on believing me. Do you trust me enough to keep saying it? All you got to do is keep believing it. Hold on to it. I hear your words. I heard you when you prayed it the first time. Hold tightly. Without waving to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. The NIV version, New International Version, it says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Somebody say unswervingly. Glory to God. That means not wavering and rocking and reeling. You know, I grew up in the church. I don't know why, where that verse came from, but we had it in so many songs. Sometimes up and sometimes down. Stop wavering. I ain't going to be up and down. I'm going to be up. I'm going to be steadfast, unmovable. I'm going to keep abounding, increasing, going higher, getting better in the work of the Lord. Because I know my labor is not in vain. Hallelujah. Then finally that verse from the, from the Amplified says this. Hebrews 10, 23. So let us seize and hold fast and retain without wavering the hope we cherish and confess and our acknowledgement of it. What we seize it, hold it, don't let it go. Keep retaining it without wavering up and down. The hope we cherish and confess and acknowledge and the, our acknowledgement of it for he who promised is reliable, sure, and faithful to his word. I was watching something, I, 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 really, I would really encourage y'all to watch, it's really, uh, it's, 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 really it's, it's called, uh, it, it just came on Netflix this week, it's called Last Chance U, Last Chance U, U stands for University. It's about East, Lo East Los Angeles Junior College, and these are all kids who for one, either for athletics, I'm, going, I'm not going to use the A they use, I'm going, either for athletics, either for uh, uh, academics, and I'm, the next one I'm going to add, or because of the attitude, okay, uh, have the ability and the skill to be playing at D1 level, but because of their either, uh, they may have some deficits, in athletics a little bit that they can work on or 
they just didn't have the grades or they just have a bad attitude to somebody. But the coach is a serious Christian. And he is ministering to these kids. He, he, he is ministering to these kids. And one of them, one of the kids said, he said, you know, coach, coach is not a preacher. Coach is a deacon. He even they even show him at church. He goes to a church about 20, 30 people. Man loves the Lord and he's, and he's committed to coaching these kids. And the reason why he's not coached at, at a D1 level like he used to, because he just want to be home with his family every day. And one of, one of the kids said, he said, yeah, coach, coach is always preaching. He, just always, he said, you know, he's a preacher. That's what he's going to do. He said, but he said all that. He said, but it don't mean nothing. He said, it don't move me. I said, he don't realize it's moving him. He don't, he, don't mean, he don't realize every time coach prays for him, it's moving him. He, he don't realize that every, every time coach, the coach keep reminding him, he said, God got you here. God, God, God's want to do something great in your life. And it's, 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 not, it's not a Christian um, production. But he's letting them know you got a hold to your profession. And then one, several of the kids, one, one of the kids talks about his father. He says, uh, one, one of the mothers said, she said, I never told him when, when, when his father said he was coming around. He said, I never told him that he was coming. I would just let him be surprised. He said, because his word wasn't good. So I didn't want to tell him he was coming and let him get his hopes up. That's really what the point I was making about this. Can I tell you, God's faithful to his word? You can go ahead and say it. He's going to back it up. He's faithful, that promise. You don't have to worry. I, I don't want to say that and then he not do it. I don't want to say it and he not come through. No, he who promised is reliable, sure, and faithful to his word. Because I need you to say it. Because I will come for your words. I will send angels for your words. Are y'all getting this? Satan comes for your word also that you've heard. The word that you've learned and the word that you confess. So there's warfare over the words you've heard, over the words you've learned, and the words that you confess. Go, go to Mark 4. I'll start bringing this in here. Mark 4. Starting in verse 14. I'm going to kind of probably exegete this as I go through it. The sower soweth the word. Now, I believe this is the latter part of this because Jesus tells this parable first, and they're like all, they're all listening. And uh, then Jesus goes on. They, they, learn, they, they, they get together with Jesus. I said, Jesus, now what were you talking about? <laughs> what was that again? Who the sower? What's the word? I don't, we don't understand these parables. So now he starts breaking it down to them. And as he breaks it down, explains it to them, he says, the sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. What's sown? The word. Right now, as I'm preaching, teaching, declaring, the word is being sown, not just to your ears, but into your heart. It's being sown into your life, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, even after you hear what I'm saying, some of y'all get excited, some of y'all write down. No, I'm going to keep on saying that. I'm going to keep on holding God's word. But after you hear this, Satan cometh, the prince of Persia. Try to withhold you. Try to constrain you. The, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that's sown in the heart. So the word is sown, but now has to take root. So the devil will come immediately. I mean, you could, sometimes you can come to a church service, somebody can get saved, somebody can, uh, something happens in the atmosphere, faith arises through the worship, or just through other people, or even hearing a testimony, and then as soon as you leave, uh, you hear something, you say, oh, well, oh man, I guess, I, I, you lost the feeling now, and you no longer believe that. You have to know that after you hear the word, the devil's coming for the word. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that's sown in their heart. Verse 16. And these are they likewise that are sown on stony ground. Now stony ground are those, he said, who when they have heard, immediately receive it with gladness. Hallelujah. He's the God of miracles. Woo! Go. I receive my miracle. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hey, come on. Dancing and running, running around. And you receive with gladness. I mean, you wasn't, you wasn't playing with God. You were sincere. You really received with gladness, but the gladness only lasted for the service. He said they received the word with gladness, but look at verse 17. 
they have no root in themselves. And so they endure for a time. Can I tell you one of the things that we're real deliberate about here at Right Direction? We're going we to run. We're going to dance. We're going to shout. Glory to God. We don't do it often, but every now and then somebody come, might even roll. But you know, there's a holy roll. We don't do a whole lot of that. Okay? But we, we, we're going we're gonna to be expressive in our worship and all that. But then we're going to sit down and get the word too. Know why you got to sit and get the word? After all the rejoicing is because the word, the t- teaching is what gets you rooted. Teaching roots you. Emotions don't root you. Dancing does not root you. Teaching roots you. Praise doesn't even root you. Because if you, if you don't, if, sometimes you got to praise based upon the word you know. So watch this. And these are like what's on the stony ground when they receive it with gladness. But they have no root. And so because they have no root, they endure for, for a time. It's saying it's only temporary joy. Only temporary happiness. Only temporary, um, uh, t- t- temporary excitement. But they have no root in themselves. They endure for a time. And afterwards, I want you to see this. Affliction, persecution arises for the word's sake. Immediately they are offended. Offended in this case doesn't mean get mad. It means they stumble and fall away. Now, can, uh, watch this. Look at verse 17 again. They have no root in themselves, so they endure for a time. And afterward, when affliction and persecution and pandemic arises. Did you, yeah, I said what I said. Affliction and persecution, which would include things like a pandemic arises. For the word's sake, immediately they stumble and fall. I don't believe that anymore. Well, I, I was believing that as long as everything looked like that was possible. I was believing that as long as the person who I thought to be in the White House was in the White House. I saw someone who supported the, our former president, preacher. After her choice didn't get in, he was on. <laughs> I was just trying. Who was your hope in? Get up here crying out the election like Jesus ain't on the throne anymore. Affliction, it comes for the word. Say, who are you rooted in? What are you rooted in? Who is your faith in? Things that happen, it happens because the devil is coming to try to steal your word that you're believing on. It's, watch this. It's not about whether you can hold on to the car. It's whether you can hold on to the God who gave you the car. It's not whether you, whether you hold on to the house. It's whether you believe even if I lose this house, I'm never seeing the rights and forsaken, nor his seed baking, baking bread. I'm not going to take any thought for my life, what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to wear, what I'm going to put on. After all these things, the Gentiles see. If he don't bless me through this, he'll bless me through that. If it don't come this way, it'll come that way. But God is going to supply all my need according to his rich and glory. If I have a temporary setback, it's just a setback that's a setup for my comeback. Are y'all listening to me? That that's how people of faith who believe the word we stand on the word no matter what what's the new word period period I believe God period with a T at the end period have no root then verse 18 says and some people hear the word and it's sown among thorns these are those who, they hear the word, but the cares of, of the world, the, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, it enters in and it chokes the word and becomes un, un, unfruitful. I want you to see something. The first one, immediately, because they have no root. They just got gladness and a shout. They have no root. For, and then the second one, it takes some circumstances to happen. But then the third one is a little more gradual. It says chokes. To choke is to suffocate or to cut off the flow of oxygen that one needs to breathe. Chokes. And so it it happens gradually. These are those, they hear the word, 
and the cares of this world. The cares of this world, it does not say that these are, not, these are figments of your imagination. The cares of this world are really things that go on in the world. Cares of, you really do need to pay your rent. That's not a figment of your imagination. The car payment really is behind. The devil is a lie. They keep saying my, 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 my car payment is three months behind. My car payment is paid. No, it's behind. Okay. There's certain things you just got to walk out in the natural. Okay. Now you can believe, no, it's caught up in Jesus' name, but right now that's behind. And that, that red dot, if you ever look at your credit report, the red one, that shows it was behind. So the, the cares of the world, things, you really do have to pay rent. You really do need to pay more. These, these are real bills. These are, these are real situations. And the Bible's not ignoring that. It's not making light of that. But he's talking, about, he's talking about the care of it, that you're carrying the burden of it. And God does not, watch this, I need to catch it. God does not want you caring like that. Now, it's the difference between concern and care. Care, the root word of carry is care. God does not want you carrying around the burden of things that he was created to bear for you. Cast all your care on him because he cares. He carries it for you. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Carrying around, burdened down with it. All because we do not carry, toss it over on him. Because according to 1 Peter 5 and 7, he cares. He carries that for you. So these are people who they had a good confession, they were believing the word, they were standing on the word, they were talking about what God was going to do, they, they were letting it come out of that, their, their mouth, but now the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, let me tell you all the simplest way that I've seen the, how the deceitfulness of, of riches chokes people's spirituality, when you get so concerned about making money that now it chokes away spiritual things in your life. You can't come to church anymore. You don't have... Eat, I, you can watch this at any time. You don't even have time. It amazes me how many people I have stumbled across and I say, how, uh, 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 did, 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 did you see my Bible study last week? Oh, I didn't get a chance to watch that. Th this is the next Wednesday. The whole week? And you didn't have any time to go back? Which is why some of y'all need to be in the house of God. Because if you ain't in church, you ain't thinking church. If you're not under the word, you're not thinking word. So the cares of this world, I got to make money. I got to start to stay afloat. I got to work two and three jobs. Only reason why I talk about that, because I know some of y'all, when you hear me talk, they say, you, 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 it's easy for you to say that. Cause no, no, no. I'm, I, the reason why I, I never preach about anything that, that, I don't have, that I don't have some experience in. I, made, I had to make that decision really early on. As we had just gotten married, I was working, I was working two jobs, one time three jobs, right after we got married. I was, I was a full-time social worker, then I was, then I was a student too. It's just crazy. Full-time social worker in child protective services, then I had this other job that I, I, well, I can't remember, what, I remember I was driving a couple of times a week to do that, and then I was some, doing something called SPRU, the special response unit, which was that now we're on call, if there's any case of child abuse anywhere around, I got to get in the, in the car, state car, and drive to that, net, drive to that county, and then, and then I, I, was, I was getting to the place I wasn't able to study the word, and I, getting to the place where I was missing church, I said, oh no, no, I can't do this. Because I knew the calling of God on my life, and I knew what was necessary. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but I know I'm called, but you will put no attention on the calling. So watch this, the cares of this world, the safeness of riches, the loss of other things. Now you fill in the blank of that. The seafarers are rich, has got to make money. Cares of this world, I got to take care of all these things that really do need to be taken care of. But now he says the lust of other things. What's the lust of other things? Might that be a relationship? The lust of other things, might that just be recreation? The lust of other things, may that be golfing? The lust of other things, may that be in a case like me, you know, people always trying to get me to go golfing with them, and, and I don't want to go golfing with them. 
I'd rather go on my boat. Would it, would it be like just being on the, you know, I, the reason why, one of the reasons why I know we got to get back to church, because if I don't get back to church, I might be out on that boat <laughs> where all my neighbors are. This is the time of year. Boy, they coming out there. They out there on the boat. That's, that's wonderful thing. God gives us all things to enjoy, but not to the place, not to the place that it chokes the word and the lust of all these other things, the pleasures of life, keep us from focusing on the word. The lust of other things, it enters in and chokes the word, look at this, and it becometh unfruitful. It doesn't bring about the results it should have because you let all these other things, the cares of life, the season of riches, and the other things choke the word. And it doesn't bring forth the manifestation of the, and the harvest that it should have. So you still grinding in the natural rather than experiencing supernatural harvest. You still grinding, trying to make everything happen for yourself. I said to someone recently, I said, you got to believe that God can take care of you better than you can take care of yourself. Let me say that again. You really got to believe that God can take care of you. Be- God can take care of you better than you can work for. God can take care of you better than you can get degrees for. Now, I, I, I mean, I encourage all those things. All those things make us, make us uh, qualified and, 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 and mobile in man's natural system. But God has a supernatural system that exceeds the world system. And when people see it, they, they don't understand it. But we know God did this. That, that's the favor of God. That's the grace of God. I live a supernatural life. Can I tell you, you're looking at a man on your screen, on your phone, on your, on your wall, however you, wherever you're looking at me right now. I'm a man who has lived a supernatural life. I used to think years ago, well, I cross my T's and dot my I's. No, but the older I get, the, and I look back over my life, I realize there's so much that happened in my life. It's just because of the grace of God. Just because I just believe God could and he would. I don't know how it's going to happen, but your word says it, so I have nothing to lose by confessing with my mouth and believing it in my heart and letting you bring out about the manifestation. And these are they, the last part, such as, well, this is good ground. Somebody say, I'm good ground. Come on, co- confess, about, confess that over yourself. Say, I'm good ground for the word of God. These are those who are sown upon good ground. What's good ground? People hear the word, they receive it, and they bring forth. The word I receive is going to manifest in my life. I don't just come to church and preach the word and listen to the word just so I can say that I know some scripture. I want manifestation. These are those who bring forth. Somebody say, I'm going to bring forth. Who bring forth. Some of them bring forth 30. Thank God 30 is better than zero. Some bring forth 60. 60 better than 30 and 40 and 50. But some bring forth 100. Can I tell you, I want to bring forth the 100. I want to bring forth the hundred. I believe we can all bring forth the hundred. If we would put attention to the God's word, don't let the devil steal it, stand on it, believe it, confess it, work the word in your life. I believe you can have everything God said you're supposed to have. I believe you can do everything God said you're supposed to do. I believe you can accomplish everything God wants you to accomplish. But we can't get deceived by, the, by all these other things that make us think the word of God doesn't work. So there's warfare for your word. After you've heard, after you've learned, after you've confessed, now you got to make the word your word and hold on to it until it manifests in your life. Until it what? Until it manifests in your life. Until it manifests in your life. I believe in manifestation. Hallelujah. I said, I believe in manifestation. I, what I, I, I got a little distracted. What I was saying earlier, Psalm 115, the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. I believe every year I'm supposed to be increasing. I believe this ministry is supposed to be increasing. I believe we should constantly see, you know, those of us who follow the stock market or monitor stock, you know, if you get ready to buy stock, you can look over, well, how, how did this stock do throughout this day? How did it do the last five days? How did it do the last six days? How did it do the last month, the last six months, the last year? If it's been around long enough, the last five years. And, and what, what you want to see, you want to see this. And even if even there's a dip, there's a general direction. It may, it may dip, but there's, come on, I believe that, that ought to be the child of God's 
that ought to be the child of God's life. That, come on, we're, con- we're always increasing. Yeah, I may have a dip here, but, but I keep going. I keep going, and it's getting higher and higher and better and better. I believe that's how the, the righteous life should be. We should flourish more and more. But you got to hold on to the word because your words are heard. Hold to the profession of your faith without wavering. Let me show you how, how important this is. How did you get saved? Through words. Let me show you that and I'm, and I'm done. Romans, 10th chapter. For those who say you need a paper Bible, this, this one's going to work right now. Romans, 10th chapter. Romans 10, let me go to King James Version. Verse 8, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee. The what? The word is nigh thee. Even in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which you just heard me preach. It's close to you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That if you confess with your what? Mouth. You speak those words of faith with your mouth. And if you believe them in your heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Here's the principle. In that script, he's talking about salvation being born again. But here's the principle. Now he generalizes it, to, he generalizes it to all the promises of God. Verse 10. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That word salvation, Greek word is soteria. God's best. Nothing missing, broken, lacking. Deliverance, peace. Whatever positive thing you can think, you got to confess with your mouth. That's how you got saved. I believe it and I said it. I believe it and I said it. I heard the word, I believed it, now I took that word that I heard the preacher preach or that I read or that I heard and I make it my word. So can I tell you, Jesus Christ is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords, but that's not enough to make you saved. What makes you saved, what caused you to get born is when you say, he's not just the king of kings, he's my king. He's not the Lord of Lords. He's my Lord. He's just not the Savior of the world. Now I confess him with my mouth and make him my personal Savior. That's how we're going to get manifestation in our life. You hear this word, keep speaking that word, and understand there's warfare for your words. But when we keep believing the words, and I'm going to show you as we go on this next week, how this, this wasn't just with Daniel, how words spoken cause angels to move on our behalf. Jacob sees a ladder going from earth to heaven as a vision. Then somebody got the wrong interpretation and tried to get up on the ladder. And they start talking, we are climbing. No, we ain't climbing Jacob's ladder. Get off the ladder. It's not your ladder. Get off Jacob's ladder. It wasn't even Jacob's ladder. It's a ladder that he saw a vision of. But in the vision, there were angels ascending and descending. Know where they were going? They were going to the storehouse. They were going to get the riches that's in glory and bring them back down to manifest in our lives. All those kinds of things are happening in the realm of the spirit, but you got to hold on to the word. And that's why the devil fights you so much for the word. That's why the devil wants want, want you to say, I can't live saved. Every time you say that, he's fighting you for that word. It's, it's not working. Doesn't look like I'll ever get ahead. No, you got to hope. I am who God said I am. going to do what God said I can do. I'm the healed, not the sick. I'm the rich, not the poor. I'm going in, not coming out. Things are getting better, not worse. God's working on my behalf. 